Hello, everybody. We have conflicting stimuli. We have oppositional forces in history moving. Well, would it be redundant to say against one another? Probably, right? But everybody has a death project. Everybody has a death project. There are some intellectuals, some members of our intelligentsia, some members of our you know, public-facing cohort who essentially take it as a matter of fact, one way or another, uh, without much interjection of ideology, that we're going to lose millions of people, a few hundred million people, over the course of the decade, you know, throughout the end of the decade. And there are interesting, diametrically situated ideas as to why this is occurring. So, one idea is that corporatism, profit-seeking above all else, the enslavement of the global south, oil companies, and our way of life as it is, it's going to kill hundreds of billions of people just as a consequence, essentially, of the metabolism, the metabolic requirements of our complications and therefore complexity. Something that's complicated is just a simple iterative process. The complexity has organization to it. So... We're going to lose 20% of the world's habitable land mass, maybe by the end of the century. Um, we'll lose healthful ecological quality of the oceans, perhaps well before that, you know, by 2050 or so. The, it's the limits to growth logic of an MIT study that came out in the 70s, perhaps the 60s, and the primary prediction is that global civilization, society as we know it at this technological stage, will be severely challenged in 2040. And it looks like we're ahead of schedule on many of the challenges. And some of the challenges are self-propagating and self-propping up. They're self-erecting, if you will. So if you look at the way money works at the bank, and we've got this double ledger bookkeeping where it's not a zero sum game, but you have interest, which means that you must create money, which means that you must have growth, which means that you must have more claims on the same amount of resources, which essentially is inflation. We promise ourselves inflation, and instead of using the fictitious currencies and our fanciful ideas of what money is for the benefit of the people at large, we use it to furnish forth the largest arms manufacturing industrial complex in the world, the military industrial congressional complex. We have this year paid over $857 billion dollars to this complex, to the Pentagon, to Halliburton, Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, Boeing. Am I forgetting one? At any rate, more than half of the national budget of the United States goes to the military industrial congressional complex every year. And since we are the largest and greatest arms manufacturer in the world, it actually incentivizes the seeding of war. So take the conflict in Russia and Ukraine, which doesn't help global supply chains. It doesn't help the project of globalism. It doesn't help the economy. The project of globalism is over, and I'll get to that. But we are incentivized on a number of scores, not the least of which being that we can offload our military surplus that we wouldn't have been using anyway, at a premium to the Ukrainians for the purpose of defending against the Russians. And then we also get to watch 
one of our premier enemies in the world whittle itself down in real time in this escalatory fashion where we're flirting with the idea of nuclear war. We're not supposed to escalate. That is a very dangerous game to be playing because what you're going to end up with is the person who wasn't going to be firing, firing first in a preemptive manner against their opponent when they get to that point just before the edge where everybody's sure that it's actually going to happen. There's no legitimate anti-war movement. There's no real concern for stopping this because we're we're energy blind, we're war blind, we're geopolitically blind. We've we've really accepted quite a bit of the darkness of the new dark age. And I could go on actually about the consequences and breadth and depth of that model, but let's actually look at another model that's been presenting itself increasingly lately that is quite interesting. And essentially it is those who are literally in league with these for-profit entities and institutions, uh, for-profit think tanks, like very profit-motivated sources of intellectuals, they're telling us that the problem is actually the environmental movement and wokeness, etc. The problem is our willingness to confront and address the problem at all because, and then they go into how it's actually an anti-human solution, what have you. So, because you can't get rid of fossil fuels because of the, the complexity of that situation. So you're going to need fossil fuels to build your t wind turbine and your photovoltaic cells for your non, you know, for your renewable energy sources. You're going to need fossil fuels for your Haber-Bosch process and for your ability to fertilize and grow the food that sustains the population of the world today, right? So I want to be clear, I don't believe that the only way to sustain a large human population of what we are currently at of 8 billion and beyond, we, the only way to do that is not by living in a purely profit-driven world. If we were to distribute our resources more equitably, we could have more of us, but for every one of us that we add to our society, especially to our lived quality of the Western world, what we're doing is extracting a lot of resources. There's a metabolic cost to our growth. We need to have a species level, societal level discussion that we're not prepared or equipped or evolved to have about the management of ourselves as a biological organism. We're not prepared to have this kind of discussion because we didn't evolve to deal with breadth and depth of time and space. We are a finite organism and it used to be the case that we lived on average a far shorter life. I. I I wonder if some of that is skewed because even in the platonic dialogues, we've got this concept of the old, the old, right? And uh, the average is what it is because of so many deaths in childbirth. So I'll have to think about that and read about that. I digress. The issue here is who's running the death project? You know, <laughs> that's one issue. Right there. I mean, we've got many who are detached from the death project, so to speak, ideologically. It's a diffuse happening. It is a consequence of our behaviors and the way we've situated ourselves that we're going to lose hundreds of millions of people throughout the course of the end of the decade. Or it's corporate forces. It's corporatism. The willful uh, ignorance of people allowing for theft before our eyes at a grand scale. I mean, twice now in my lifetime, I've seen in a, in a couple of years, essentially the printing and the creation of 500 years worth of fictitious currency that immediately got funneled to the topmost echelons of our financial elite uh, over the course of about two years. This is the second time that's happened, right? 
2008-2020. So in order to keep the fictitious interminable growth story alive, we are defaulting on the economic model as it were, which is laden with all sorts of internal contradictions. You know, that's one model. The other model here is that people like me who are concerned about this actually just want all humans to be gone because, you know, any impact is a bad impact. We can't reconcile ourselves. And so we should just be rid of the whole human project because we're like a yeast devouring everything available to us and drowning in our own toxic byproduct. That, that is the other version, is that it is people like me who are doing this. And to a certain extent, that's true. It's all of us. But we need to be aware increasingly of our energy demands. We need to be aware increasingly of the minerals that we need to sustain our lifestyle. We need to be increasingly aware of the labors that are required to sustain our lifestyles. If we all became more locally involved in such labors as humans actually need, instead of predatory, unfulfilling, wasteful behaviors that propagate nothing but the growth of the economy at the expense of all human quality and length of life, that, that is the economic model we're rooted in right now. We so often are not making improvements for people's lives, what we're doing is making more waste and predation, more dollars for ever decreasing group of privileged few humans. While, while the most of us have to toil, I mean, let's be real, uh, work for a wage is slavery. That was Abraham Lincoln's view. That was a mainstream Republican view in the 1800s. What is the difference, really, between renting yourself for some number of hours and selling yourself? What is the difference? It's very slight. It's very minor. What is the difference? You are told so often what to wear, how to present yourself, how to speak, what to say, when to go to the bathroom. What level of tyranny is this that we have allowed to be exacted on the human race? And... Were it not for oil, then we would have natural limitations of our labor requirements that would prohibit us from concocting this scheme of endless, infinite growth. It wouldn't, it wouldn't occur. And we've used so much of our technological proficiency and our increased productivity to make more work for ourselves. The, the vision of the past a few hundred years used to consist of intellectuals saying in a hopeful manner, our technological improvements in, by way of production and capacity are going to free up huge numbers of workers where it's going to depress the need for menial labor. What have we done instead? Instead, we're on the fast track to getting rid of all the artists, to replacing them so that we can focus on our boring work, our unfulfilling work, our wasteful work, our predatory work that no one even needs, that's giving you hypertension, that's giving you diabetes, that's giving you a gun, that's giving you trauma, that's giving you a reason to consume, that's giving you another addiction so that we can grow together so that we can grow the economy for a few billionaires. That's what we're doing. That's one version. I guess the other version is that, you know, people like me just want to destroy humanity. I want to see humanity flourish. I want to see humanity be well. That requires a nuanced discussion and interposition and interjection of human-centered values. We must have as our utmost priority the quality and length of human life. Not profit. Because when you center profit as your utmost goal, people die. 
people are killed by the the mere running of the economy. You can look at the pandemic, which is a great example of this, which is not only dampened supply lines and depressed global relations so as to further take us away from the projects of globalism. We've allowed more than a million people to die, most of whom were vulnerable, elderly, sickly, minorities. Because, you know, we'd rather run the economy at the expense of human life. What's really valuable here? It's not a human with rights. It's human capital. Right? Does it have the ability to get up and walk and move stuff and do work? Does it have the ability <laughs> to move something from one place to another and not put it back? Otherwise, no work is done. It's a physics joke. So whose death project is it? It's a great question. But we know there's a death project, right? We know that hundreds of billions of people are going to die. Why? Who? How? Those are our questions. How do we stop that? You know, is that possible? Or is that just something we're all going to take for granted? And we're just going to do the Spider-Man meme where we're all pointing at each other for who's responsible. Could be that. Well... I don't know how the future is going to go. I only know what you know, the group of intellectuals that I've been exposed to is talking about, what their discourses are, what the data say, what the data portend, what we are on the trajectory toward. But, well, there are... There are a number of complications. For instance, take innovation itself. Innovation becomes less efficient as time goes on. You have fewer, easier discoveries to be made as we make more discoveries. So single genius inventors make fewer and fewer patent-worthy innovations um, you know, throughout the centuries. It takes more and more scientists to make a patent-worthy innovation. It makes more involvement of a greater number of disciplines to be able to create, you know, patent-worthy innovation. Innovation gets less and less efficient as time goes on. That doesn't mean that we can't make technological developments that vastly improve or change the landscape and the situation. So, for instance, the development that is particularly exciting, I have a cautious optimism here, is the development of fusion of successful fusion reaction where we've made more energy than we put into the process. So we're containing a star in a box basically, right? We're using really hot, huge lasers in California and shooting them into you know, hydrogen pellets and a container with deuterium and whatever. And there's all this fancy chemistry and physics going on where they're getting x-rays to bounce out around the capsule and the, this process somehow, you know, ignition, so-called, makes more energy than we put in. An incredible feat of human innovation, if it's true. So, this could change everything, you know? It could be limitless energy. This could be the next can we kick down the road. Like, when we hit peak oil in the 70s, and then in the 2000s or so, we actually got to fracking, and we kind of refreshed the rate, if you will, of economic growth. Who knows? Maybe we'll continue to grow the population of humanity. Maybe we'll continue to grow economically and continue some of the unsightly trends we've socially engineered for ourselves. What is the concern here? Well, the concern is, one, is this true, right? Is this a scalable development? And if it is scalable, then in 10 to 15 years, perhaps, we're looking at an incredible change to the information and energy resource landscape. It's just what is available to the entire world. This would be a, a paradigmatic development that would absolutely set us in a new era. And we'll see a, you know, an announcement from, I believe, our energy secretary from the lab tomorrow. 
as a matter of fact. So, whose death project is it? Yes, but also, is this scalable? Is this real? And if so, are we going to distribute it? And if so, are we going to do so equitably? Those are the only questions that matter. We need to secure a notion of human rights, food, water, shelter, healthcare, education. Or people aren't going to get those things. And we're going to return to factory towns. And we're going to return to renting out space to sleep from our bosses. And we're going to only go to the, to the doctors that work for the company that we work for. And we're going to lose all of our benefits if we lose those jobs. You know, I don't know any of this for sure. No one knows what's going to happen in the future. I know only that we're in these rigid, bureaucratic, anti-human establishments and institutions that are focused on the marriage between global capital and the state power against the will of the common people, the quality of life of the common people, the length of life of the common people. It's a death project. We have multiple death projects. And they have bought the rhetoricians, and they have bought the media amplification so as to confuse the issue of whose death project it is. Make no mistake, it looks as though it is a class war. We have this billionaire oligarch class, the lords, suppressing we, the neo-serfs. And we should be aware of this. We should be aware of the advents in energy level innovation, and we should take great pains to watch and see and curate the process such that we can secure the rights and dignity of humans be fit of 21st century humans. So we must watch the developments in fusion. We must sort out whose death project is this? Can we fix the death project? Can we mitigate the death project? Can we choose not to do that? But what is our cohered global socio-cultural narrative? What happens when we move away increasingly from globalism? From 2018 onward, from getting rid of, you know, the relationship we had with China in terms of soy and tech, you know, China changing everything to Brazil, supply lines, shipping containers, all of these things have to move just for one input. Well, now we're talking about blackouts and mismanagement and demographics and fewer destroyers navigating the waterways, fewer people to work. Our oldest generations are retiring and are becoming various modes of infirmed. We've allowed infirmity to sweep through the population by way of COVID and long COVID and COVID reinfections. We're going to, if we want an economy, may have to make a more human-centered economy, or replace us all together as much as we can, wherever we can. And as humans, it should be within our interests to see to it that the quality of our lives is given increase, not decrease. Maybe we will have to make do with less. A lot of this hinges on this fusion issue, right? We're, we're really teetering between precipitously different versions of the world here, right? An incredible catastrophic rapid simplification, a catastrophe, or developments to new heights that were never anticipated and seen before. We've been at this precipice crossroads for a while. Now it's particularly potent, given that we've this particular development of fusion. Will it be distributed equitably? Who will it be for? Can we scale it? Is it real? That's going to have a lot to do with whether or not we can fix the death project. It's going to have a lot to do with whose death project it ends up being. Whose death project it may have ended up having been. How many people will we lose over the course of the decade? Will we continue on our worst trajectories? Or 
can we intervene with ourselves? Can we make an awareness? Can we prioritize the education of the young to make an energy and materials and labor awareness such that we can organize human rights and human dignity and human quality of life around these necessities rather than around the spurious, wasteful, wanton, predacious luxuries of the day, which are in many cases illusory and are terribly taking from those who have the least. So whose death project is it? How involved in it are we going to have to be? What are we going to do with fusion if it truly has been cracked? These are important questions that I want for us to be able to be asking ourselves. Where does our energy come from? Where does it go? Because energy is neither created nor destroyed. What are we going to do with it? What are we doing with it now? How guilty should we be? And that that's what indeed some of those will say in the think tanks. They're going to tell us that we're demonizing every aspect of human life and trying to take away everything. So how do we do this in a measured way? How do we take from those who have truly taken over much, right? I mean, by rights, by rights of productivity and development of technological capacity and power, you should have a three-day work week. Why don't you? You don't have a three-day work week and you don't have the benefits that you don't have to the extent that you don't have them because we have billionaires competing for largest yacht and first to colonize Mars while we have humans starving on Earth and the ocean is becoming acid and the atmosphere is becoming unbreathable and unlivable in terms of its temperature. That is a gross imbalance in terms of wealth and power and rights and dignity that we should not countenance any longer. As time goes on and people more and more see the quality of human being that a billionaire becomes or that a billionaire must be in order to become a billionaire, chicken and egg relationship there, feedback loops for sure, we will see that we have to eat them all, right? We're going to see that um, it would be nice if we only had to eat one of them to get the message across, but we can be sure to be done with them if we just eat them all. If we just cut them up in front of each other, pass them around the table, and eat them, and then distribute their resources to people. If they want to spend... $44 billion on a project to amplify the voices of anti-Semites and supremacists of various kinds, rather than working to solve world hunger. And yes, if there's corruption to fight, let's assemble the forces to fight it. Let's do that organization instead of organizing with Cat Turd and all manner, Nick Fuentes and Kanye West and all manner of anti-Semites and all manner of hatred, all manner of imposition against civility, against science, against reason. You know, if that's what the project of humanity is going to be like in this 21st century, then we need to radically steer it in a different direction. We need to take the reins of this in as much as we can, realize our position as neo-serfs, and band together as we modern slaves of the day. And yeah, there are various degrees of slavery. I accept that. I understand that. But we're all participating in it, and we're all participating in the, the death projects, whether we own them or whether we intend them. We must be aware of our heteronomy, our action by law, incentive, and homeostasis. We must be aware of our energy use and our material use and our labor inputs. Where does that labor go? What's it servicing? What project are we working toward? Are we being wasteful? Are we being predacious? Or are we be being legitimately productive? What does legitimate productivity mean? Does it mean food, water, education, healthcare? 
Does it mean securing the rights of humans? What does it mean to breathe? What are we producing? Whose death project is it? Are we part of it? How many slaves prop up our lifestyles? How much do we slave? And why is it that so much of the human story is about trying to be a slave as little as is possible? We should be asking these questions because we've been afforded the ability to. We've been given the tools to do so. Let's not make light of them. Let's use them while we have them because there, there are some visions of the world that would have us knowing no more than is required to do the menial tasks, to execute the menial labor, and to seek for as little as possible. Whose death project is it? What version are we going to take part in? I don't know. I don't know the future. You don't know the future either. To secure the bright future, we must ask these questions. We must pursue these awarenesses. We must pursue collective action. We must pursue our best selves, our best communities. We must pursue the rights and dignity of humans. So thank you very much. I love you. Incredible that you've stuck around. And uh, we'll be sticking around through more, more to come. So let's keep our eyes on these developments around fusion. Is it scalable? Is it real? Is it equitable? Will we distribute it? These are important questions. These are going to set us up for one precipice or another. Vastly different trajectories are possible here. Even in these moments where things have degraded so much. The kids are sick, the parents are not well. Wasn't this year supposed to be easier? Just a fun world we're living in. Hey, we got this. We got this.